start that. And then <clears throat> what I want to do is um, go through something, the how to study guide. Okay, I just want to go through that a little bit because this is how you should be um, continuing going forward as you study through the material in preparation for the CPA exam. So it's a little different than your other classes in terms of the process uh, that we will take here to complete homework. So complete our, uh, our preparation for the exam. So uh, take a look and uh, I'm going to read through this. This is uh, something that I wrote some time back as to how to study uh, for the CPA exam. So I don't really have an expectation that you will do advanced reading in this class. I don't think it helps you much and you're going to be preparing for the exam more by interacting with the homework questions that uh, we have embedded in the uh, software. So the important first step as you have accomplished here today is to come to class and as we go through the material, I will be suggesting flashcard. And I'll literally write FC next to the area that I think you should flashcard. And I'm going to be giving you some advice as to how to prepare those flashcards uh, here as we go through this first class or so. Uh, but for the most part, the approach is you write a short question, short answer, uh, question with a short answer uh, on the other side of the flashcard blank side for a short question short answer uh, on the line side. And you should use a three by five cards. Um, those travel easier with you. If you have to move around, you have to go different places, you're on the bar or something, you can uh, bring those with you and it prevents a situation that you would write too much. I want it to be quick question, quick answer approach uh, to the flashcards. After you have made, uh, after you have uh, come to class and noted the flashcards, then you should make flashcards. Now, since uh, part of the package that you acquired uh, through Golden Gate uh, from Becker includes pre-made flashcards. If you see a flashcard and the electronic flashcards that are in your software, they pretty much match what I'm suggesting. I don't expect you to write up another flashcard. You know you have that there. Uh, in the event that I suggest something or I provide you something that isn't part of those pre-made flashcards, you should make that card and then you should memorize all the relevant cards uh, for that chapter. By memorize, I mean no peeking. You should be able to recite the answer to every single flashcard from memory. That in and of itself will probably take you anywhere from three to four hours uh, to complete for an entire chapter. So since we typically will go through half a chapter, you should spend a couple to three hours doing that part of the work, memorizing the card. Then you should go through and work the multiple choice questions in your homework, and I ask you to work those at 75% accuracy. Now, what does that mean? If you work, say, 100 questions and you got 60, that means you're at 60% accuracy. So what should you do? You can ask Becker to only give you the questions that you got incorrect in the software, and it'll feed back to you only the incorrect questions. Let's say you went through those, and of those 40 you missed in this example, 100, you got 60%. That means you missed 40. Maybe you get 20 of those right. Well, now your percentage has gone up to, what, 80%. You do not have to work those questions any longer. In fact, I don't want you to. I want you to put them aside. If you keep working them over and over again, they're going to lose their, um, they're going to lose a certain amount of uh, thinking that you have to do to answer the question. Pretty soon you'll just memorize what the answer was to the question, and that's not making you any stronger for CPA exam day. Then you should go through the task-based simulation. There are typically task-based simulation for every module. By the way, I will try to complete a complete module by the end of each class. I try not to go into a module and not be able to finish it. So we'll go through the module and you most modules will have task-based simulation. You should work through those task-based simulation as well. Um, and I imagine that should take you anywhere uh, from one to two hours. So that means that uh, for a week's class, you're probably spending about three to four hours of homework outside of class. And I've given you an example um, as to how you might uh, prepare your study schedule. And of course, this is a little bit uh, generic. 
uh, because this class obviously meets on Tuesday as opposed to you viewing lectures on Monday, et cetera. But you can adjust that accordingly uh, for our Tuesday uh, meetings in this class. OK, any question on that? <laughs> OK, now, as we talked about last time, I'm not going to be you know, expecting you to get you know, a certain grade on the homework and whatnot as you go along. I am going to be looking into the Navigator software, and I am going to be looking to see that you're making progress. And so please don't fall into the trap here in the you know next several weeks where I start saying, hey, I was looking at Navigator. I haven't seen you doing anything. What's going on? You're turning in a CPA planning document. You're talking to me about how you plan to accomplish this goal of uh, passing the exam, and I'm looking at how that is leading you up uh, to that goal in terms of how you're completing the homework. Uh, I got some students who say, well, I'm not going to do anything because I'm not taking the exam later. Well, that's not the class. The classes that you're going through and you're taking steps, it'll get you towards the exam if you're going to be taking it like we talked last time, say early January, whatever, fine. If we're going to be taking it later on next year. That's fine. But I do expect you to be uh, looking at this material uh, and learning the material as we go along. Question. Okay, good. Um, I do have a quick question, Professor. Yeah, sure. Um, sorry, I wasn't here last week since I was prepping for FAR, um, but I am taking DEC and auditing. And would you mind briefly going over what you think the timeline should be for me taking those two exams after these classes are finished? Yeah. Um, I Sorry, I didn't that. get a chance to review the um, recording. Right. Um, I wrote that down. We'll just have to remember where I wrote it. Um, one second. Um, so what I suggested for BEC was January 17th. Um, okay. But that contemplated folks starting um, regulation or FAR in the spring, uh, which you may not be doing. Yeah, no, I'll be done. Yeah. Um, so I would say that you could schedule, uh, you know, BEC um, or audit, you know, a couple weeks after the class ends, which is near the beginning of January. And then the second exam, BEC or audit, I'd give yourself two more weeks. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Yeah. Because uh, you will kind of not have that, you know, it's a little tighter for students that have the uh, pending next class starting, right? They want to get those out of the way soon enough, whereas you won't have nearly the, uh, that you won't have that sort of tide coming in on you. Um, you could kind of schedule that second exam as you see fit, but I still think it's worthwhile to be keeping up with the material concurrently with going through the class. Yeah, that's the plan. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Appreciate yes. it. Mm -hmm. How did FAR go? Uh, I actually had they canceled because of technical issues, so I'm rescheduled for October 10th. You canceled or they canceled? They canceled. They, uh, I got there and they had us sit out there for an hour and then said, uh, here's a phone number, here's a IT uh, ticket number, call and reschedule because they, mm. something's wrong with, was wrong with their internet or something, so. Wonderful. Yeah, that, that was great. I was ready to go and yeah, you got to shake that kind of stuff off, I guess. I um, <clears throat> I was talking to a guy, and he was telling me that he had a near-death experience, and ever since then, he can summon all the patterns uh, that helped him to, like, um, pick out a winning uh, keynote ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me this story, and, of course, he's talking to an auditor, so I'm kind of like, hmm, okay. <laughs> But then I thought to myself, well, the only uh, 
spirits I can seem to conjure up are ones like what happened to you. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm always able to attract the negative energy somehow. It's so just I'm sorry that luck. happened, but hang in there with it. Um, and we'll, uh, we're, we're here if you need us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I figure four weeks to review, uh, four more weeks isn't bad. So I'll take yeah, it for what it is. Work. Yeah, it'd have been nice to have it done, but yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, good. So with that, then let's go ahead and let's jump ourselves into chapter one. Okay. And I'm going to put us on full screen. Okay. And guys, um, be prepared to be interactive. I am going to be putting up a poll for the class questions that we have. I typically give about two minutes for you to respond, and then we go through that question. And uh, if I don't get the response rate that I expect, there's uh, 15 of us in here counting me twice. So there's 13 students. I'm expecting 13 responses. And if I don't get 13 responses, I start calling out folks. And uh, so uh, make sure that uh, you're, you're following along as we go. And I want to give you sense of a potential point value. Now, because we're talking about business environment and concepts, we're talking about overall management of a business, we're going to be starting at a high level talking about risk management, risk management, both from a standpoint of internal controls, and that's going to be about five points, but also from the standpoint of overall enterprise risk management. And again, the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission, a private organization, not-for-profit organization, put together some uh, guidelines for managing risk in a company, both from the standpoint of the internal controls associated and how to match risks and rewards with the goals and objectives and missions of a company. We will talk about Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes-Oxley has several components to it, um, including what are some potential uh, fines, penalties, that sort of thing that an entity would encounter if engaged in some sort of financial um, reporting problems. But then it also talked about internal control as well for, and because it's a federal statute under the uh, <clears throat> idea of interstate commerce, uh, it is regulated under the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley Act is under federal statute. And so uh, we'll take a look at some of that here coming up. Business processes, again, about five points. And then I'm just going to combine these last two, which we will probably get into next time. Uh, financial risk management is, again, a five-point area, and the only reason they've split those into two is because they like the modules to be a little bit more bite-sized, but that would be considered one overall area, okay? So you take a look, and you've got some pretty high uh, point value here uh, in this chapter, and again, I think we'll probably get, well, I would say if I had to handicap it, we'll definitely get through uh, the first three modules, possibly uh, module four here tonight, and then you'll go through and work the homework connected to those modules for the uh, remainder of the time until we meet again on Tuesday next week, when we'll go through uh, modules, excuse me, five and six here in chapter one. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and start to talk about COSO. And so what happened some years back uh, there was an entity called the Committee Sponsoring Organizations, the Treadway Commission, and they published guidelines that could be used by companies to assess whether or not the internal controls were meeting certain objectives of the company. And those objectives of the company include uh, reporting, reliability financial reporting objectives, but they also include compliance with laws and regulation objectives and operational objectives of the company. Now, what also happened around that time is it was looked at and said, well, look, since we're talking about a structure of internal control or financial reporting, 
then auditors can also use this structure when they're doing work that is required to evaluate the effectiveness of an entity's internal control in connection with the financial statement audit. So when you take, or if you're gonna be taking the auditing class, you're going to hear some of this again because auditors will also use this structure to evaluate uh, the internal control. So although I think much of what you'll talk about here, you can see coming down, we talk about the company management and its board of directors, okay, using this to understand what constitutes an effective system of internal control. We're going to see that auditors can also use this structure. When I say we're going to see in auditing class, we talk more about it from an auditor's perspective to evaluate an entity's internal control in connection with the audit of the financial statements, okay? And so you can see here that the framework also provides confidence to external stakeholders. And the classic example there would be the auditors of the financial statements are considered external. Okay. So you go ahead and you take a look and you can see this pass key here that it requires more than adherence to policy and procedures by management, the board of directors, and the internal auditors. It requires the use of judgment in determining the sufficiency of the controls and applying the proper controls and assessing the effectiveness of the system uh, of internal control. And again, um, it can be used by both internal management board directors, but also what external parties, classic example there would be the uh, auditors of the financial statements. Okay, now you take a look and um, over to the next page and they give us this COSO cube here, okay? And when you look at this cube, the primary takeaway here is that there are five components, okay? We have five components, one, two, three. Well, that's kind of hard to see, red on red. So let's go ahead and just use black for this one, two, three for five components, and there are three objectives. So we have different objectives. As an auditor, I'm always, you know, kind of focused on the reporting, financial reporting objective, but of course, it's also important that we operate our entity in a manner that's going to allow us to be profitable, to achieve the entity's objectives, and of course, in compliance with laws and regulations. So when we look at these five components, okay, we're going to see that the five components are then made up of 17 principles. Okay, so we have components, we have principles, and those uh, three categories of objectives uh, are what the entity would be doing in evaluating the internal control. And again, as auditors uh, look at it, they would also do this. So we have the control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information communication, and monitoring. Now, um, you can go ahead and flashcard the components and the objectives. If you want to, you can just go ahead and flashcard that cube, copy that, have it as part of your uh, flashcards, make shrink it down, make it three by five flashcard size. But it's also worth to note that even though we're showing this as a cube so that we understand the interrelation between the objectives and the components, it is, could also be depicted in a circle in that what happens? The board of directors, senior management, really are sitting at the top of the organization and we consider that an integral part of the control environment. So when we have monitoring, primarily through internal auditors, they report back to what? Back to those board of directors, the board of directors then see what is in those reports, allows them to do a risk assessment. What are some risks, both internal and external, that are going to affect our ability to achieve the objectives, operating reporting compliance, we put control activities in place to help mitigate those risks. We then have what? Information and communication so that our rest of the organization understands what their responsibilities are for achieving these objectives as it relates to the specific control activities. And then we monitor to see that indeed those control activities are helping us achieve the objectives, come back up. So it is continuous 
uh, improvement, okay? Now, there is a way to remember the components. There's a mnemonic that Becker uses sometimes called CRIME, C-R-I-M-E. The only problem I have with that mnemonic, okay, is that it kind of goes out of order and that control environment is number one. Number two is what is the risk assessment. Number three is the existing control activities. Okay, and that's what they use that E for, the existing control activities. Then we have what information communication. And then the fifth piece, the fifth component that comes down is the uh, monitoring. So even though you can use that mnemonic, be careful that you realize it is a process. It's just not a rote memorization of the different pieces, okay, different components. Now, we take a look and you can see here that we list out the objectives, which you saw already, operating objectives, reporting objectives, compliance objectives, okay? Now, when we look at operating objectives, they talk about efficiency and effectiveness. So it could be what? Being profitable, being cost efficient, but maybe we have as an objective what? to be a technology leader or something like that. So could be things like that. Reporting objectives, I think for the most part relate to, you know, it says external and internal financial uh, reporting. Um, a big one obviously is our external reports because as a company we have to provide reports to users of financial statements for a public company. We are required to file those reports with the Security Exchange Commission, et cetera. And then we have compliance objectives and there can be compliance laws related to tax filings. There could be compliance laws related to occupational safety and hazard uh, requirements, okay? And as I mentioned, we do have the mnemonic for the components, which is crime. I just want you to be careful with that mnemonic and that it does not list them in terms of the order of the process. Now, <clears throat> when you look at the next, page here and you can see that the control environment is the most pervasive part, most pervasive component of the internal control. Most pervasive, meaning that it does what? It touches all the other components. It starts at the top and it touches all the other components. And again, they went out of order here and that, um, you know, control environment is one, risk assessment is two, information communication is three, but then we, I mean, it is not. Number three is existing control activities. Number four is information communication and monitoring is fit. So the way you first saw in that cube is the order contemplated by the um, uh, Treadway Commission. Okay, and again, they're going a little bit. Somebody's obviously in love with that mnemonic, so that's what was uh, contemplated. There is that you would fill those in. Five components, and then we have seventeen principles. Now, principles, principles. Okay. Now you take a look. And as I showed you a second ago in e-learning, what I did was I went ahead and I put up a flashcard that calls out the five components, right? There they are, one, two, three, four, five. These are in the correct order. And then the 17 principles that constitute those um, <clears throat> five uh, components. Okay, and we're going to talk about these. Um, the book is not consistent with the way it's called out in the COSO framework, and so I decided to go ahead and do this, and I would make five flashcards out of these per component. What are the principles related, and then that will help you to answer the questions, even though the book uses a little bit of a different uh, way that they're describing this. For example, when we look at control environment here in a couple of seconds, notice they say demonstrate commitment to integrity and ethical values. Uh, it does what? It's at a high level, the board, okay? Uh, what? Demonstrate commitment to a competent workforce, okay? 
holding people accountable through performance evaluation, et cetera, okay? And I'm pointing that out. I'm not going to sit here and read off every single one of these here to you. You have these as flashcards, but I'm pointing that out here so that as we get into back to the, uh, meanwhile, back at the textbook, right? You're going to see similar themes, although they're not articulated exactly the way COSO did. So I think it's worthwhile to make your flashcards for these areas that I'm going to go through quickly with you here back to that more detailed, obviously, uh, flashcard. OK, so what happens? We have the control environment okay? and we saw that there is a commitment to ethics and integrity. Right. And it points the focus, including setting tone at the top. So we're talking about what? We're talking about the board of director. They are independent. They have the oversight. Okay. We talk about organizational structure. And a classic example of organizational structure is that if you have the internal audit function, okay, the internal auditors do what? They report directly to the board of directors. Now, when I say they report directly, boards of directors do not write performance evaluations for the internal auditors. They don't pay them. So there may be a dotted line to the CFO, CEO of the company, but they do what? their reports go directly to the board of directors. That is an organizational structure that would do what? That would demonstrate the independence and the importance of that monitoring process when the internal auditors feedback what their findings are uh, to the board of directors, okay? We see a commitment to competence. So we would have an expectation that we're going to hire competent people, both uh, maybe um, you know, as employees, but also we may contract with a CPA to help us with uh, various aspects of our financial operations, et cetera, okay? So there's a commitment to hire, develop, retain competent employees, but it could also involve uh, contracting with competent individuals to provide certain services. And then there is succession planning. And this is something that probably companies uh, fall down on a lot and that they've got the staff in place, but um, nobody works for a place forever. My dad used to tell me no job lost lasts forever, John. So uh, what happens? You know, there will always be some level of turnover and there needs to be a uh, succession planning associated with that, okay? Now, accountability, individuals are to be held accountable. We saw that, hold individuals responsible, right? In the flashcard I showed you, for their internal control responsibilities. So we will establish performance measures, incentive, rewards, and evaluate those for ongoing relevance with whatever um, we are requiring of them uh, in the process. Okay. Okay, good. That is the uh, requirements there for the control environment. Let's look at the next component, risk assessment. And again, they don't number these as 17 objectives the way the flashcard did, but if you count the total, they can restart numbering again. But this would be, you know, starting with um, specifying objectives, this would be the sixth objective, okay? And you don't have to memorize what number, I, don't know, I should say objective, but uh, the sixth uh, principle. And you don't have to remember principle number six is, you don't have to remember it that way, just know to what extent the principles belong to the components, okay? But we take a look and we are going to identify and analyze risk and we are going to see how those risks affect our ability to achieve our objectives. And then of course, how do we respond to those risks, okay? And uh, that includes considering the potential for fraud and uh, identify and assess changes um, just because things are potentially working for us at one point in time doesn't mean they will continue to. That's why we have that monitoring process, okay? So we assess the risk and then guys, the book is going out of order here. They should be, in fact, I'm just gonna go to the proper order just so this doesn't become just me listing off principles under the components. The third piece now is what? 
is going to be just coming over the existing uh, control activities. Okay, so you come over and let's just go to that. So we've understood the risk and then we put control activities in place that will help mitigate uh, those risks. Okay, so we will go ahead and develop and select the control activities, okay, whatever they are, select and develop technology controls and develop policies and procedures to see that we are actually going to deploy and put into action control activities that are addressing the risk that we saw in step three. Step four is you can sit here all day and you can have all of these uh, control policies and procedures. And if you don't do a good job communicating those, okay, you're gonna communicate those internally so that individuals understand what their responsibility is for achieving the different control objectives, okay? So you can see here that the organization internally communicates information necessary to support the functioning of the internal control. And then we are going to what we are going to communicate with external parties regarding matters that affect the functioning of the internal control as well. Classic example there, they don't say it necessarily, but they're really talking about we have to communicate with the CPA firm, maybe with regulators. We put all that in place and then we monitor. Okay, and the monitoring has to be separate from the rest of the process. So we want separate evaluations to be done. That's why we have that one. That's why we have the internal auditors reporting directly uh, to the boards of directors. Okay, now when you take a look, you can see that in the past key here, they went ahead and okay, they put it the 17 principles that are the components, but I think you're better off rather than messing with this pass key uh, that kind of uses a little bit of different language than COSO. Why don't we just go ahead and uh, use what we have here, <clears throat> wherever that went. We're gonna lose that, I thought I had it there. Okay, um, go ahead and use this as your flashcard. It's ready made for you. Just go ahead, print this, cut these out, glue them, tape, tape them. To your flashcards and you have them listed out here uh, for you in the language that COSO used. Okay, <clears throat> okay, good. Now you come over and as we're evaluating the internal controls, because remember that's really what we are using this structure for is ultimately to evaluate the internal controls, then of course we want to determine if those controls are effective and how they help us to uh, achieve the objectives that we saw, reliability and financial reporting. I always mention that one first, even though it's in the middle, but compliance with laws, operational, okay? And then you take a look and they tell us, well, what are the requirements? And all five components and 17 principles are relevant to both present and functioning or have to be both present and functioning. Now, that means that as you evaluate each component, you're looking to see that it's, it has those 17, those not all, not all of them have 17 principles, but the relevant number of principles, whatever it is, five under, um, <clears throat> under the control environment, et cetera. Um, but you have to see that they are there and they are working together. Okay, we don't see them as separate pieces. For example, remember that the control environment did what? It touched the others. The principles are all going to support that control environment working together. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't see that there isn't a principle that is relevant, but if a principle is not relevant, there needs to be a clear understanding as to why a particular principle is not relevant. So as you evaluate, the components by evaluating the principles, you are looking to see what is the design of the control. Will it achieve the objectives? Okay, so it means that the components are relevant and are included in the design and implementation. So they have designed the control and they are using it. Now, is it functioning 
does it have operating effectiveness? And so that means that even though they may be using a control, is it operating as designed? Okay, so you put a control and you design it well, you implement it, you put it into place, but if staff don't understand their responsibilities, then what? Then the information communication component of the internal control has fallen down. And so even though you may have well-designed control that is achieving an objective and the board of directors is committed to it and you communicated it, if another component down here, which is they haven't fully understood that, then you haven't fully communicated. And so uh, you would think that there was a weakness in the internal control. So it is worth noting that you have, and I kind of like to do this as a little math equation, design plus operating effectiveness, present plus functioning equals what? Equals effective. It has to be both. And again, note that what all five components need to work together. If there is a component, and I think it'd be highly unusual for a particular component not to be uh, relevant. Uh, sometimes students will say, so wait a minute, what if an entity is too small to have a um, internal audit function? Wouldn't that mean that the monitoring is not relevant? No, that means that somebody other than the internal audit department is going to have to achieve that um, uh, monitoring aspect. And that points back probably to what? To the board of directors, and it would probably be individuals of the board of directors, maybe individuals sitting on the audit committee, they would have to also carry out the internal control function if the entity was not sophisticated enough to actually have an internal audit department. Okay, now we take a look and we can see they have some specific requirements here. So we have to, con have to be uh, considered an effective system in internal control, senior management and the board of directors must have um, reasonable assurance that let's go ahead and flash card some of these things here because that sounds to me just like a CPA exam question. So on the blank side of the card, and guys, I'm not going to always do this with flash cards, but since we're just starting out, I want you to understand what I mean by a flash card. So on the blank side of the flash card, you would write to be considered an effective system in term control, senior management and the board directors must have reasonable assurance that the entity, and then on the line side of the card, you're going to write down and are not going to necessarily go through every single one of these. I'm going to um, put down the ones that I think will be particularly relevant to help you answer uh, CPA exam questions. So let's take a look that the, um, that will not achieve it, um, that the entities um, understands the extent to which operations are managed effectively and efficiently when external events may have a significant impact on the achievement of the objectives of the organization or the organization can reasonably predict and mitigate the impact of external events, complies with all applicable rules, regulations, and prepares reports that are in conformity with the entity's reporting objectives and all applicable standards, rules, and regulations. So you can see that um, they really, and the reason I had you highlight that second part down here, and that's what I want in the flashcard, is that's really getting to what? The objectives that we saw at the top of that COSO cube that we were looking at here a little while ago. Okay. Also note here that ineffective control deficiencies are shortcomings in a component or components and relevant principles that reduce the likelihood of an entity achieving its objectives. So if you've looked and you've identified some weaknesses that then relate, that then will constitute a deficiency in the control that needs to be addressed. And um, there is a difference between what uh, U.S generally accepted auditing standards uses as terminology and what COSO uses. GAS talks about significant deficiency in relation to financial reporting issues. Um, COSO uses the term major deficiency uh, as it relates to not only financial reporting objectives, but also the compliance and the operational objectives. 
Okay, good. Coming over and taking a look at the limitations of any system of internal control. And guys, when I look at these limitations, the one word that comes to my mind is people, right? People make mistakes, okay? People are not perfect, okay? And so almost all of these are related to some sort of human foibles, you know, human frailty, whatever, right? And so breakdown because of human failure, biased judgment, issues relating to the uh, suitability of the entity's objectives, external events beyond the uh, entity's control. I guess that doesn't have to be entirely related to people. For example, you could have a hurricane or something, a disaster. Circumvention controls through collusion that deals with people and what management override it controls. Flashcard that. I can see that being an essay question on your exam. Remember that your exam, um, your BEC exam has what? Has as one of the task-based simulation, you're going to have to, one of your, uh, your fifth test lit, I should say, is going to have what? Three task-based simulation, which they're gonna have, ask you to write an essay. I can see this being an excellent essay question on the exam. What are some inter uh, inherent weaknesses, internal control? You have a nice flashcard on this. You'll probably max out the points on that uh, written communication object um, problem pretty quickly. Question. Okay, good. Let's see if my polls are working. They are. So I'm going to go ahead, put up the poll. I will give you two minutes to work this multiple choice question. Um, you see right here that you can also look this question up later as you go through your homework. If you wanted to refresh on what we may be said about a particular question, uh, and obviously they're here in the textbook. And the answers also uh, appear at the back of the uh, textbook for BEC as well for the class questions. Okay, we're at about two minutes. Um, I've got 10 responses, 11 responses. So one person is not responding. Don't get me into the mode here. I'm going to have to start uh, calling roll to see uh, who's not responding. Okay, so, um, but let's go ahead and take a look. And we did pretty well on this. Okay, just about everybody got this right. I look for us to get at least around 75% when we're working the questions the first time when we go through them. Remember, I said that when you go through your homework, you should strive for 75. You should try to get a 75 on your homework questions as you go through them. Once you get to 75, you can put those questions away. You don't have to work them anymore. When we do our final review in the weeks leading up to the exam, the expectation is that your percentages will go up to 80, 85%. So by the time you're on the CPA exam, your percentage should be around 90% accuracy for multiple choice questions. If 50 points come from multiple choice questions and you're at 95% accuracy, that means you're getting what? 
45 points just for multiple quote multiple choice questions alone that means you only need what that means you only need 30 more points to pass the exam 30 out of 50 coming from the task-based simulation that means that you could be doing work at what at a 60 percent accuracy level in the task-based simulation and still pass the exam and if you follow the rules that i talk about in terms of how much time to spend moving through getting the points on those task-based simulation there's no reason why you should be able to pass uh, the exam with a nice score now you take a look over here and um, we have this uh, the external auditors um, assess the achievement of internal control objective each year and then they do what they communicate that uh, to the board of uh, directors okay and the board uh, communication by the external auditors illustrates what well if it's external to internal then what happens that's external communication internal communication which i think maybe one or two of us pick would be more of the board of directors potentially talking to the employees or the internal auditors not the external auditors the internal auditors talking to the board of directors that would be seen more internal question okay good let's go ahead and let's take a look at the next one get a hundred percent response here guys um if we get it in less than two minutes i will call the question early uh, so you don't have to take the full two minutes but i want everybody to try it professor i'm in my car driving and listening to your lecture so i'm not going to be able to answer just so you know okay thank you Okay, we can go ahead and take a look at this one. And um, most of us got this right. The choice here again is D as it was last time. And uh, when you look at this accountability, which someone picks C, um, you know, typically means that we're holding individuals inside the company accountable. Uh, for their responsibilities in internal control. And so we probably have language more along that line, as opposed to talking about the knowledge, skills, and abilities of an individual that deals with competencies. Okay, so that phrase really up here, knowledge, skills, and abilities, okay, to me really is what constituted more of the competency and really pushed you towards choice D, which most of us got. Now, I noticed that we've had choice C a couple of times is not the right choice. And let me say something about C, okay? Because there's sort of this thing out there that people say, when in doubt, pick C. There is nothing wronger, is that a word? Is that a word in the English language? Than that sentiment when it comes to the CPA exam, okay? The examiners intentionally figure out 
a mix a, of the letters so that there'll be 25% chance there'll be A, 25% chance it'll be B, 25% chance it'll be C, 25% chance it'll be D. There are only four choices for each one of the multiple choice questions, but they scatter those distributed the way I talked about the 25% uh, for each letter, okay? So if you have to guess, you have to think to yourself, have I picked a lot of C's so far? Have I picked a lot of B's so far? And if you've already picked what you feel has been a lot of C's, don't pick C. If you've picked a lot of what you think to be B's, don't pick B's, pick another letter if you have to guess on a question, okay? Don't forget also that on the CPA exam, you really should be working through these questions at a, at a uh, rate of about a minute and a half per question. Now, I give you two minutes here while we're learning, but you really should be at about a minute and a half per question. I am not so worried about speed at this point as I am accuracy. So I want you to be striving for 75 to get 75 on those questions. As we move closer to the exam and get to the final review, though, then I'm going to need you to adhere to the time. Now, it's about a minute and a half per question. Questions like this probably should take you in the neighborhood really of about 30 to 40 seconds, not really more than a minute. When we get to say managerial cost accounting where there's calculations and whatnot, yeah, that might take you a little longer, but you should never, you should never on the CPA exam spend longer than three minutes on any one multiple choice question. Do not blow your budget on one multiple choice question like that. When I say your budget, your time budget, okay? No one question is worth it. In fact, Remember that there are a set of questions, about 15 of the uh, multiple choice questions that you have on your exam. Again, it's 15. Maybe that's a little high. I don't know that it's 15 anymore. It used to be 15, but of the multiple choice questions you have on your exam, there are definitely some that are not graded. They are pre-test questions. So think about it. You spend five, six minutes working on a question, trying to get it perfect. Meanwhile, it's a pre-test question. It's not graded. You're going to spend way too much time on a uh, question that contributes nothing toward your passing score on the exam. Okay, so keep that in mind and keep moving through questions. Any question on that? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at um, using the COSO framework that we've talked about, and there's really a few different levels. You will use the framework for an overall assessment, component evaluation, remember there are the five components working together, and then the 17 principles, and then there will be the summary of the internal control deficiencies that will come out of that. That will feed back to the board of directors. Board of directors will then do what? a assessment of the risks at that point and so on. And we go back through uh, that process, okay? Now let's take a look at material omission or misstatement, okay? And management identifies risk that could individually or in combination result in material omissions or misstatements in the financial statement. So now we're just dealing with that one objective reliability and financial reporting. The process for evaluating risk is dynamic and ongoing. Risk vary as an entity operates in, and you can see things that are going to increase the risk. Multiple markets, geographic areas, maybe there are different response, uh, maybe different requirements for different geographic areas, multiple regulatory environments with different standards. Uh, if an entity is operating across various state lines, then it has to comply with, if you're having sales in another state, let's say, then you have to be cognizant as to the sales tax requirements in each of the 50 states, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> a dynamic technological environment, high executive turnover environment, et cetera. Okay. Now, the other major consideration is fraud. Okay. And what they tell us here when we look at fraud, okay, there are usually fraud risk factors, okay, fraud risk factors, okay, and at a high level, those fraud risk factors include incentive 
and pressure. Okay. Now, when we look at fraudulent uh, activities, it relates to fraudulent financial reporting or um, misappropriation of assets. So you can almost look at it, you probably heard this in terms of lying and stealing, right? Okay, it's fraud, lying and stealing. Oh, by the way, guys, I should probably, you probably figured out by now, my handwriting is atrocious. It always has been, it always will be. Uh, it was atrocious when I was five years old and it is gonna be atrocious the day I die, okay? So what happens? Um, I, when I write, I repeat what I'm saying. So you're better off listening to the audio clues as to what I'm writing rather than what is he writing and trying to read it, just sort of listen and then, you know, maybe write what I'm saying around somewhere in the book where I'm saying it. So I'll repeat. If you don't know what I'm writing, just ask me. Okay. So what did you say, John? What is that? Okay. So when we talk about fraud, we're talking about lying and stealing more fancily put we're talking about fraudulent financial reporting that's lying stealing is misappropriation of assets okay and we see these fraud when these fraud risk factors exist at a high level incentive and pressure okay so what happens if i show a higher net income i'm going to get a big bonus well that would be an incentive if i don't show a higher net income i'm going to get fired that would be a pressure right okay then what? Then we have opportunity. Okay, opportunity is really what poor and I see is internal control. If you have poor internal control, fraud is going to happen. Okay, so if you aren't safeguarding your safeguarding your assets. You're not using, you know, those sort of cables and stuff where you lock things down. You're not taking a periodic inventory of equipment and whatnot that you provided to the employees, computers, monitors, that sort of thing. They're going to get stolen, right? So that would be a, a factor that would lead to misappropriation of assets, okay? And then number three, and I always seem to end up squeezed into the corner over here. Number three is rationalization. of attitude. Okay, now rationalization of attitude says what? Employee looks at the situation and they say, I've been working here for 30 years. They never appreciated my, off, my uh, efforts. Let me steal $5 million. <laughs> okay, they rationalize the stealing, right? Um, could be what? a dominating manager. Management overrides the controls. They say, I'm the boss here, I own the company. They override the controls and override of controls would also what, provide opportunity, okay, for the lying, uh, the fraudulent financial reporting the misappropriation of assets, okay? So when you look at this more detailed list here, management bias and exercising judgment would probably be a rationalization for overriding the controls, the degree of estimate and judgments underlying the accounting and reporting would probably be a rationalization, or it could be covering up what some sort of um, covering themselves with some sort of incentive or pressure. Okay, incentive for frauds is obviously uh, incentive. Okay, they list out bonus attitude and rationalization. Okay, now unusual transactions would be a symptom of one of these three high level things that I've talked about here. Okay, so for example, uh, a large disbursement for which there's no appropriate description. Well, maybe that's pointing to what some sort of rationalization of attitude where somebody is misappropriating the assets. Okay vulnerability to management override of the control, obviously what points to opportunity, but it could also point to rationalization, could point to uh, incentive and pressure, okay? So when you look at these details, it's not like everything, I mean, obviously rationalization fits under rationalization, incentive fits under incentive and pressure, but it is more of an art as to where you kind of categorize these into the three areas, so I want you to flashcard 
at a, uh, at a more detailed level, um, the, you know, various components here that, uh, and understand that they would probably fit under these three broader categories. Okay. Okay, good. Now, management override, I think you know, refers to management just saying, eh, don't worry about that control. It says that we have to get, you know, dual approval under any disbursement over $5,000. It's okay. We don't have to talk to the second person. Just go ahead and push that through. And they pressure you because what? Because you need the job or something, right? That's what we mean by management override. Okay. Now, illegal acts are a little different. Illegal act could be what fraud by definition is intentional. Okay. Fraud by definition is intentional. An entity may commit an illegal act um, accidentally, right? It can happen. Gee, you know, I thought that we had the appropriate compliance with occupational safety hazard rules, but it looks like this is not in the spirit of what the requirements are. So we violated the law, whatever, right? So those kind of things can happen accidentally, okay? But how would you identify if an illegal act, uh, act could potentially uh, occur? What would be some indicators that something has occurred? And again, um, that's relating, although it could also relate to our financial reporting, for example, if we don't file our tax returns, that's going to relate to financial reporting because we have to report what? Deferred taxes and deferred taxes would require us to know what our actual current taxes are to be able to figure out what the deferred portion are. So it could affect our financial reporting, but obviously it's what hitting for the compliance objective uh, pretty heavily there. Okay, so if there are existence of investigations, reports by regulatory examiners, payment of unspecified services, that would be an example of potentially a bribe going on, delinquent tax returns, right? Again, that's going to affect not only compliance, but also finance reporting. Uh, the one that I would also add to this is fines. If they're seeing fines being paid, what's going on there? Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and management considers how the risk of material omissions and statements could be managed across the entity and management selects and develops and deploys controls to effectively apply principles within each component. And so we've seen that now a number of times, the components, and then we consider the principles. So we're really just repeating ourselves there. Okay, now take a look at selection development controls and the selection development controls can include any of the following approaches. Okay, so we're talking about the actual control activities now and we could use workshops. Okay, remember we have to communicate the responsibilities so maybe we have some workshops. We could outsource the function, consider the type of control activities and when you look at the control activities, guys, you really line those up with whatever the risks are. So you may be looking for segregation of duties. Now, in doing that evaluation, and this is something that I would share more with the auditing exam, okay? But um, I think it's worth <clears throat> looking here just to understand. And now we're looking at it more from the standpoint of how management would do this. And I'm gonna post this up. It's not there yet, but I'll post this <coughs> PowerPoint slide up here a little bit later. I have called out of another set of information from the auditing class, okay? But I'm looking at it here from the standpoint of an auditor, but let's just take a look at the risk assessment that would be done, okay? We have potential misstatement. Okay? And again, I'm looking at it from the standpoint of uh, financial reporting here. And the potential misstatement is that as a sale is reported, but it never occurred, okay? So we have what? Potentially fraudulent financial reporting, right? And we have a control technique. And what the entity would do is look at that control technique and assess how effective it is in preventing this bad thing from happening, okay? Then what? Then they would go ahead and they would place control activities in place. They're doing the risk assessment, place control activities in place that will do what? 
that will prevent or detect the bad thing from happening, okay? And then there would be, and again, I prepared this from the standpoint of how external auditors would test for this. Internally, although we may use some of the same procedures internally, the internal audit department would monitor in the, in the vernacular used in COSO, see if they're seeing the problem still being manifest and then go ahead and suggest changes and those changes would maybe lead to some improvements. And in this particular thing, I gave two mutually exclusive examples where maybe things are working a little better in the second one versus they're not working as well in the first one. But that's the process. You're looking, you're seeing what the risks are, you're looking at the control activities that will address those risks, you monitor, you feed that back to the board of directors, board of directors make some changes, you monitor, and so on. Okay? But you're always in this continuous process where you're always responding to the risks and you're always going to have to be doing some monitoring to see if those risks are still um, manifesting themselves. And if they are, then you're going to have to address that accordingly. Again, I'm talking from the standpoint of management there. Okay. Okay, good. So now you come back and you take a look at the textbook. And so different development of controls, uh, consider all alternative controls, um, and then identify incompatible functions and whatnot, and just continue to make those improvements. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and flashcard as I asked you to the nature of the kind of control activities that um, would um, help you to uh, mitigate some of these risks. And then um, you will go ahead and the selection development of general controls over technology can include the following. Let's flashcard that because you know that technology is here to stay, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and flashcard. Use control make matrices to document uh, technological uh, dependencies, evaluate and user computing, implement or monitor control activities when outsourcing IT. If you're having your payroll being processed, which most companies do by say um, EDP, uh, ADP or somebody like that, then you need to understand, well, where's the risks over there? Generally an entity like that will generate a re uh, report from their auditors saying that their controls are reliable. So you'd want to get a report like that, for example. Okay, uh, do we have to segregate duties? Do we have to restrict access? Continue, configure the IT system to support processing transactions, administer security access, use of passwords, restricting uh, you know, um, access to certain um, information in the computer system. How about this one? Uh, if a document is considered a top secret document in the government, you shouldn't take it back to your house, <laughs> okay? Uh, is another example of security and access and apply system development life cycle over package in, to internally development uh, developed software to you know, see that the you know security around that and whatnot are it's keeping up with any technological changes or changes in the operating environment of the company. So flashcard those, and then um, develop controls through policies and procedures. Okay, and I think that's sort of self-explanatory. So I'm not going to have you flashcard anything there. Okay. Okay, now we are going to take a break right now. Usually I take the break more around 6.30, maybe 6.20. I want to take it now because I think as you are seeing, this is not the most stimulating stuff in the world, right? It's a listing of the kinds of things that an entity needs to consider, the internal control as it relates to the objectives of compliance, of reliability of finance reporting, and uh, operating objectives. Um, what we're going to do is continue with sort of a, you know, theoretical principles driven discussion when we talk about enterprise risk management. Okay, and what we're going to be doing when we come back after the break here is really getting a feel is how will we go from the uh, mission of the organization to whatever sort of uh, activities we're going to take on to achieve those objectives 
those activities will almost always bring risk. How do we manage those risks? And when we manage those risks, we're really going to look at what, what is the likelihood and the impact of that risk. And we're going to take steps to try to mitigate the likelihood and the impact of risk as we try to move through to achieve the entity's objectives, okay? So that's where we're going next. Um, I'm going to have us come back here at 6.30. That's a little more than the usual 10 minute break, but I don't like to get into weird times like saying 6.27 and that kind of stuff. I'm showing about 6.17. So we'll come back at 6.30. Thirty. Okay, I will pause the recording. Somebody, please remind me when we come back to restart it. Uh, so, if you want to view this later, you don't have to sit there and fast forward through uh, the break. The <clears throat> recording, and uh, we're going to get started back here with uh, module two: enterprise risk management framework. And again. Uh, we're looking at, um, you know, guidance that is provided by COSEL, okay? So uh, just like the internal control, the objectives of financial reporting, uh, the operating objectives and the uh, compliance objectives, enterprise risk management is actually a much uh, bigger look at the overall organization and uh, how <clears throat> um, they are going to manage the achievement of the entity's uh, mission. Um, interestingly, uh, forgive me, guys. I'm going to have to close the curtain on that side as the sun creeps over, starts to get in my face a little bit. Um, as we take a look, um, we're going to see that, um, or I should say interesting, we're not going to look at it here, but um, under the Obama administration, uh, they passed a requirement that um, federal agencies use enterprise risk management to manage their um, operations as well. So it is something that's getting broad uh, acceptance, both across uh, for-profit and uh, not-for-profit uh, entities as well as government entities and particularly at the federal level, there's an actual statute now that requires that entities use enterprise risk management. Now, before we get into some of these details here, um, are risks good things or bad things, do you think? Bad. You say something, Donald? Bad. Yeah, I would say they're bad, right? A uh, bad risk would be what? Um, the risk that I will get injured if I engage in some sort of activity, right? So that's the, the, the bad thing, okay, good. So why would anybody engage in an activity in which something bad could happen? Why would you do it? Prospect of gain. Yeah. yeah, so when they look at it, right, uh, even though they call it risk management, they really should almost call it what? Risk reward management? I mean, that's really what you're doing. You're saying, well, risk management, there's a risk. Just don't do that. And the problem won't happen. Well, if you don't do something, maybe you're going to miss out on the reward. So it's really what? Risk reward management. Okay. Now, what happens? Let's say I'm a pharmaceutical company and I want to develop um, some sort of drug that will help uh, cure some disease or treat some disease, whatever. Um, what might be some of the risks associated with that? You might get sued. Okay, I might get sued. I might develop this product and then it injures some people and I'm going to get sued, right? So there's the potential for financial loss there. There's potential for what? Reputation loss there. There's potential for what? For the ethical consideration, you're going to hurt people as a result of this, right? Okay, so those are examples of risks. So what would be the rewards? Money and prestige. Perhaps. Money, prestige, uh, growth in the company. Hey, when it came to COVID in uh, the entities that were trying to develop the vaccine for that, I think that everyone realized that we had to do something for the good of the country, the good of 
the entire world in some cases, although some countries chose not to use the US or the um, Western developed vaccines and then I guess some of them are paying the price for that now. But uh, bottom line, um, there was an, an understanding even from the government that something had to be done. Um, I always thought it was kind of interesting that um, it seemed like the folks that supported Trump didn't want to take the vaccine. Meanwhile, the Trump administration's initiatives to have several companies working on the vaccine at the same time, they call it Operation Warp Speed, but by having several entities going after it at the same time, that increased the speed as to which they were able to develop uh, what I think has probably turned out to be a pretty effective vaccine. Um, at least the one that was developed by companies like Moderna and Pfizer and, and Johnson to a certain extent. Um, so anyway, the point being that what there could be a lot of rewards associated with that, the risks being what that somehow somebody will be harmed. Um, what's another risk, a risk uh, that um, maybe we'll get involved and the testing won't go as planned. So we have to start to be involved in more, say, animal testing, and maybe we start to get some pushback from different, um, you know, animal rights groups, PETA, some of those groups, and so on. And so the entity has to do what? The entity has to sit there and manage those risk rewards. Now, coming back to the risk part, when you look at risk, you have to look at it from two standpoints. One is what? what is the likelihood of the risk, okay? And what is what, what is the impact of the risk, okay? And we need to look at both of those things as we start to address those, okay? So when we start to look at that, we wanna see if we can reduce or mitigate the likelihood. And then what? The magnitude says, well, the bad thing is gonna happen, but how can we what cushion the impact on that to the company? Okay, so what happens? Let's go to driving uh, a car. Let's use that as an example. When you drive a car, you put on a seat belt. Why do you put on a seat belt? Are you trying to reduce the likelihood or the magnitude of the risk? The risk is that you're gonna get injured or killed, right? So are you trying to, the obvious reward is who can function in society without a vehicle, right? I have to do this to be economically viable in the United States and most Western society these days, right? So <clears throat> what happens? The risk is I'm gonna get injured or killed. You buckle a seatbelt. Are you trying to mitigate the likelihood or the impact of the risk? Yeah, the impact. That's trying to mitigate the impact. Airbag, trying to mitigate what? The impact, okay, good. How about the likelihood? Well, you're going to do what? You're going to obey the speed limit. You're gonna follow the traffic law. You're going to remain alert. You're gonna be 10 to two. You're not gonna drink and drive, which would be ridiculous. And you know, that's increasing the, the uh, likelihood, okay? But you are doing some things that are going to do what? going to mitigate uh, that likelihood, certainly not increase it, okay? So that's what we're going to be looking. We're going to be looking at the risks. We're going to be considering the likelihood and things we can do to mitigate that likelihood. We're going to be looking at the impact, things that we can do to mitigate the impact. Now, when we look at those propositions, we look at them in the overall value of the entity. So we're going to be looking at taking on risk that will obviously do what? have value creation, enhancement, things that are going to destroy value, that's a no-brainer. We're obviously not going to pursue those things, okay? So let's just look at a high level here of some definitions, okay? And um, note that, um, again, and it's probably worth flashcarding because I could see the examiner is trying to trick you into thinking that this is something that's only applicable to value that's associated in a for-profit entity in revenue enhancement, profitability of the company, increased in value of the company, but it could also be what in a not-for-profit entity, enhancement of services to the company, saving the country from you know complete economic collapse from a pandemic, okay, could be uh, a value for a country, right? 
Okay, so you come over and when we talk about value, okay, they tell you that management decisions, okay, I want to strike that out. Management decisions will affect the development of value, including the creation, preservation, erosion, and realization of uh, benefit. Why don't you go ahead and flashcard those different um, aspects of value, I should say. Okay, now you come over and you take a look at value creation. Okay, value is created when benefits of value exceed the cost of resources. Resources may include people, financial capital, te capital, technology, and what brand identification. Oh yeah, you're the company that came up with that pill that you know killed a bunch of people or something. We certainly don't want that, right? Okay, so we're looking for value creation on the good side, and of course avoiding value erosion, which we'll get to in a second. Value preservation is simply trying to uh, sustain what uh, actions, uh, you know, take actions that will sustain the value of the entity. Value erosion is when we develop a strategy that will cause our value to uh, decline. Okay, now when we look at these, of course, value realization, is when the benefits are received by stakeholders, and it could be monetary, again, you know, increased profitability, stock prices and whatnot. Um, Non-monetary, we're talking about, say, uh, <clears throat> where the Department of Housing and Urban Development, we're providing clean, safe, decent housing um, as a result of our value realization, okay? Now we come over <clears throat> and, it ties back to the mission and the core values of the entity, okay? And uh, when we talk about uh, core values, okay? Core values represent an organization's beliefs and ideals about what is good or bad, acceptable and unacceptable, and influences the behavior of the organization, okay? Now, this ties back to what vision, what we hope to achieve over time. And mission represents the company exists and what it hopes to accomplish, okay? So when you look at core values, right? Core values probably to me drive um, what you decide is going to be your mission, what you decide is what are gonna be your vision. So even though we've kind of listed them in a different order here, um, the term core itself, right? Indicates that uh, that is sort of the overarching piece here. Now, when you come over, and we're going to continue here, and obviously we're talking about some definitions, okay, that are used. Culture represents the collective thinking of the people within the organizations, and, um, <clears throat> you know, culture sometimes is something that um, can be a little bit uh, invisible to you, right? Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, you come over. What are the capabilities of the company? What is the competitive advantage for the entity? What are the practices? Okay, and they tell us that enterprise risk management is organizational practice continually applied to the entire scope of activities of the business. Okay, and it is part of the management decisions at all levels. Okay, now you come over, and what we're going to do is integrate our strategy setting um, uh, with mission and vision, and then use the ERM to integrate the status setting and operating activities to promote an understanding of how risk potentially affects the overall entity, and then take the steps to manage the impact and likelihood of those risks accordingly. So when we manage risk, we are going to link them to value. We talked about the types of value. Now, you come over and we talk about risk appetite. And risk appetite is the willingness of the entity to accept risk, okay? So let's look at that. Risk appetite represents the types and amount of risk on a broad level the organization is willing to uh, accept in pursuit of value. Risk appetite is a range rather than a specific limit and provides guidance on the practices and organization is encouraged to pursue or not pursue, okay? Risk appetite is first expressed 
in mission and vision, and risk appetite varies between products and business units over time. Okay. Now you come over and you take a look at the relationship of value and risk appetite. And let's take a look. And this is where ERM comes in. It seeks to align anticipated value creation with risk appetite and capabilities for managing risk over time. Let's flashcard that, okay? Because that's going to become important because that's going to lead us to different ways to manage, again, what the likelihood and the, um, and the impact of the risk, okay? So as we go through this process, we're going to um, take a risk inventory. Okay, so this is sort of like the risk assessment that we talked about before. What are some things that are going to be risk if we take on a particular uh, project? We just did some of that in the little example of the um, pharmaceutical company, right? And when we look at this, we're going to have reasonable expectations, recognizing that no one can predict risk with um, a certain level of precision, okay? Risk capacity is the maximum amount of risk the entity is able to absorb in the pursuit of strategy. And that will help us to develop a risk profile, which is a composite view of risk assumed at a particular level of an entity uh, that positions management to consider the types, severity, and interdependencies of risk and how they may affect performance. So we're looking at these risks and we're going to see how we're going to manage the company accordingly. What we will do is take a portfolio view, a composite view of risk the entity faces with positions management and the board of directors, the type severity inter interdependence. Okay, now we will look at organizational debate, sustainability, the ability of the entity to withstand impacts and large scale events. If there's something that's going to happen that's going to completely crush the company, well, that might be something to, uh, to avoid. Um, and then we will go ahead and measure the efforts to achieve or exceed the strategy and business objectives. So when you take a look, you have this um, risk enterprise is depicted as a series of sequential events, intertwined components that drive the organization towards enhanced uh, value. Okay, so if you take a look, we have our mission and we are going to move to this enhanced value. And how are we going to get to um, the enhanced value? Well, you can see that there is going to be strategy development business objective formation, implementation, imp, not, imp, not implement, implementation, and performance, and then of course leading to uh, the enhanced value. And so what happens? We have driving these at the what? Mission and core values, the uh, governance and culture, the strategy development will involve the strategy and objective, then what? Then we perform, and then much as we had monitoring in our internal control model, we'll review, we'll make revision, we'll have information, communication, and reporting that should feed back into the governance structure. So we have these different steps, and then we have these different procedures that are going to help us to manage those risks accordingly. So what I want you to do right here, guys, if we don't already have a flashcard for you in your Becker software, this is a perfect flashcard for you right here. Shrink this down and put it on a flashcard because we're going to see some of the questions here in a moment are going to look at these different uh, components of the enterprise risk management. Okay, so come on down. And let's look right here and you can see that we have the five components of enterprise risk management, which you saw above. And just as we saw for the um, um, internal control model under COSO, we have principles, 20 principles that drive the five components. Okay, so let's just go ahead and you don't really have to flashcard them again because you have them sort of down here, but just to review governance and culture, strategy, performance, review and revision, information communication is ongoing, 
And then that information should do what? Should feed into the governance and culture, the board of directors involvement, et cetera. And then it'll feed into those next steps. Now, when you come over to the next page, <coughs> they start giving us <coughs> for each of the five objectives, the principles that are associated, okay? And I'm going to ask you guys to just flashcard the principles that are associated with each of the five uh, components. We're going to talk a little bit about these here, um, but um, I want you to go ahead and flashcard them. They give you a mnemonic here, which is dubs, soar, viper, sir, tip. I don't like mnemonics like this. Um, I feel that you waste too much brain space trying to remember what each element of the mnemonic stood for. And then I don't know about you, but if I have a mnemonic like this that doesn't make any sense, I start like arguing with the mnemonic in my head. For example, dubs don't soar. They kind of flap along sloppily every dub I've ever seen. So, um, you know, I don't want to sit here and argue with the uh, mnemonic in my head while I'm trying to remember it. So I just would suggest make a flashcard that will talk about the 20 principles under the five components of the enterprise risk management, okay? And we're going to look at, uh, you know, some detail of some of these here now in the outline, just so that we're not just doing a rote memorization, although it is sort of rote, but let's get a little bit of uh, contextual sophistication to what some of these things mean. So we have what governance and culture that obviously involves what? Board of Directors Oversight. That's why we have boards of directors, right? It will help us to establish organizational structure, and it's going to allow us to carry out our day-to-day -day operations in a manner that is aligned with our overall uh, governance and culture, okay? Um, we will define our desired culture. The organization defines the desired behaviors and characteristics um, that the entity's desired culture. Um, maybe we develop a culture that says we are not going to do pursue any activity that does what? That increases global warming. We've seen enough. Any activity that we think has the potential to increase global warm warming, that is not something that's part of our culture. So we're going to uh, automatically take those kinds of pursuits off the table, whatever. Okay. And then what? Demonstrate commitment to our core values. Okay. What are our core values? And we're going to remain committed to those. So you see that when we're dealing with governance and culture, and it shouldn't be surprising, we're dealing what at a very high level of the organization. Okay. Now, when we take a look, we're going to attract and develop and retain employees and the human resources department, okay? Um, human resources professional, whether it's internal department or outsourcing that somehow, uh, should have consideration of the knowledge, skills, abilities, and experience. And um, basically it, uh, you know, are we bring in individuals that have the culture, um, the elements we're looking for that will fit into the organizational culture. Strategy and objective setting. Okay, and again, I've asked you to uh, flashcard the principles under this, but let's take a look at a high level. Um, we will have strategy, set it, strategy setting and business objectives considered both internal and external factors, their effect on the risk framed by our business context. And um, we will have an organization sets its risk appetite in conjunction with the risk uh, setting. Analyze business context. Let's take a look at, um, uh, well, let's just take a look since we mentioned risk appetite. Uh, let's take a look at defines risk appetite, okay? So the organizations define risk appetite in the context of creating, preserving, and realizing value. Entities consider risk appetite in quantitative terms while others may be quantitative. So um, uh, qualitative terms, 
trying to improve treatment for some disease, right? Uh, quantitative, I think we tend to think of what? We tend to think of the probability, okay? General terms such as low appetite, high appetite are sufficient expression of risk appetite, referencing targets, ranges, ceilings, or floors may be used. Why don't we go ahead and flashcard that? Because I think you'll see uh, some of those in questions where they talk about a low versus a high uh, risk appetite, okay? Now, strategy is evaluated from two perspectives, okay? The possibility that the strategy does not align with the missions, uh, mission, vision, and core values of the entity, the implications from a chosen strategy, okay? And we can see here that misaligned strategies may impede achievement of the mission and fulfillment of the entity's mission. And the implementation of each strategy includes risk and opportunities of each strategy, identify risk collectively, form a risk profile, and serve as the basis for developing and evaluating alternative uh, procedures. Okay. Now, coming over and taking a look at um, the development of alternative strategies considers the supporting assumption relating to the business context, resources, and capabilities, and development risk profile for strategy enables consideration of the type and amount of risk faced by the organization. So once we've gone through that process, we've seen how the different opportunities are going to uh, relate. We can formulate the business objectives. Business objectives are measurable steps an organization takes to achieve its strategy. The alignment of business objectives to strategy supports the entities achieving its missions and goals. And then we have what? We have the um, setting up targets to monitor. And then we do what? Then we monitor to see that we are staying in our uh, concept of an acceptable outcome related to achieving business objectives within our risk appetite. Again, if we were to say, um, be an oil company, and we said, well, we want to not be in where we're going to cause any additional harm to the environment or something, maybe we say, or certain limits on the amount of harm that we're willing to cause to the environment, we may say, well, we're not going to do any drilling in areas where there hasn't been previously been drilling for oil because we don't want an oil spill that's going to, you know, damage some otherwise pristine part of, um, you know, of the country or something or the world, or whatever. Okay. Now we come over and uh, we are going to have our performance. And here we're going to take a look at our risk and we're going to respond to those risks. So risk is prioritized according to the severity and consideration of the entity's risk appetite. The organization then selects risk responses and monitors performance for change. So we're going to do what? We're gonna look at the severity, the impact, the likelihood of that risk. And then we're going to do what? We're going to respond to that accordingly, either mitigating the impact or um, um, uh, avoiding uh, or lowering the, uh, the likelihood. The resulting portfolio view describes the amount of risk the entity has assumed in pursuit of its strategy and the entity's level of business objectives. <clears throat> so let's take a look at how we will label, we'll identify risk, and then we're going to put some labels uh, on those risks, okay? so. We come over and we assess the severity of the risk, okay? So once the risk has been identified, resource and capabilities are developed to keep the risk within the entity's risk appetite based on the assessment. So we're going to be looking, what is the impact? What is the, um, um, the likelihood, okay? So severity of the risk is assessed at multiple levels across the business. Risk deemed severe at the operating level may be less of a concern at the division or entity level. So let's take a look. Severity relates to the impact, result of the risk, and likelihood, possibility of the risk occurring. Likelihood may be expressed quantitatively or 
qualitatively. So let's just flashcard that, okay? Let's flashcard that when we're talking about severity, now we're picking up those two components that I've been talking about, which is what likelihood and the what? And the impact, okay? Now let's just take a look at this next piece down here. Risk assessment includes the concept of inherent risk, targeted risk, residual risk, and actual risk. Okay, so let's just take a look at these and we're going to flashcard these guys. Inherent risk is the risk of an entity in the absence of any direct focus actions by the management to alter its severity. Okay, so what does that mean? That means you're simply doing what? You're not wearing the seatbelt, you're not obeying the laws. Nothing, right? You're just not doing anything, okay? Now, target residual risk is the amount of risk an entity prefers to assume in the pursuit of its strategy and business, knowing that management will implement uh, or has implemented direct or focused actions to alter the severity of the risk. So what happens? You're saying, well, look, we have this inherent risk. This is the worst thing that can happen. We're willing to accept this much of bad, but we are going to do some things that will try to do what? Address the severity of the risk, which will do what? Will reduce the likelihood and the impact of that risk. And then the actual residual risk, okay, is the risk remaining after management has taken uh, whatever action okay and again you could put that down in terms of quantitative losses qualitative issues you know what is the um you know potential for loss of life associated with whatever the activity is etc so you can take a lot of different uh looks at that okay so flashcard these we have the you know the atomic bomb we have what the amount of that you know, bad thing that we're willing to sort of accept that's going to happen based on our risk appetite. And then we still realize we're going to take some actions to try to push that away, at least the likelihood and the uh, magnitude of it. But we're always going to be left with some amount of actual risk. So just flashcard each one of those. Okay. And um, let's take a look at. Um, <clears throat> at the uh, prioritizing risk, okay? And uh, let's just look at, uh, obviously prioritizing risk is risk that result in the entity approaching the risk appetite for specific um, are potentially given a higher uh, priority, but I wanna look at implementation of risk response, okay? Now, remember, we're looking and we're saying, well, what do we want to do? Do we want to live with this? Is this too much? We can't live with it, et cetera. Okay, so except no action is, is taken to um, change the severity of the risk. Okay, so you just go ahead and say, hey, damn the torpedoes, the bad thing, it's likely to happen, <laughs> okay? And we're not going to do anything to try to avoid it. We're not going to do anything to, I shouldn't say to try to avoid it, but we're not going to do anything to try to uh, decrease the likelihood. We're not going to do anything to decrease the impact. Okay. Avoid is say, we're not going to even do, it. we're not going to get into this risky activity at all because the outcomes are so what? Uh, so impactful and so likely, and we can't come up with a way to essentially mitigate that like um, that likelihood, um, mitigate that impact that we're just gonna avoid this. We're not even doing this, okay? Now, you could pursue action that is uh, accepts the increased risk and the improved performance. Pursuit of risk is appropriate when management understands the nature and extent of any change required to achieve desired performance while not, while not exceeding the acceptable uh, tolerance, okay? Reduce is what actions take to reduce the severity of the risk, okay? So again, mitigating techniques, driving more carefully, um, you know, wearing the seat belt, 
right? And then sharing the risk and the classic example of sharing the risk is what? Insurance. And that's basically what you do is that you said, okay, I've sat there and I've gone through and I've taken these steps to mitigate the likelihood. I've taken the steps to mitigate the impact, but I'm still going to what? CYA by sharing some of that risk by having uh, appropriate, maybe it's, you know, I'm thinking in the tone of car, you know, driving and whatnot. So it'd be, you know, um, your auto insurance, right? But uh, it could be lots of different types of insurance, maybe some sort of malpractice insurance or something, getting back to our pharmaceutical example. Okay. Okay. So these obviously, as you can see, these uh, terms here on this page, this is obviously stuff we got in LB. You're going to expect us to know these terms and understand uh, how they uh, work together. Okay. Now, as we've said, when we do this, we will develop a portfolio view of our risk, which is an entity-wide view of the risk. And then, of course, nothing stays static. So we'll have to do what? Review and revise as we go along. If there are changes, we'll have to assess substantial changes, changing the environment, change the legal requirements. We'll need to review our risk performance. Okay, to potentially incorrect assumptions, poorly implemented practices, entity capability. I mean, do you think there could have been some more of this being done? What was that company that did the uh, ended up? I think they all ended up going to jail. The company that was trying to develop that testing for certain diseases and things started to go south on them. And rather than have steps in place to review and look to see where they were going, they got themselves so tangled up that they started to double down on some of the things that weren't going well in their clinical research and whatnot, right? And then uh, pursue improvements in enterprise risk management and then information and communication. And of course, um, that is something that management uses and can also be uh, provided to external sources. If we're developing a drug, there's probably some sort of reporting requirements that we're going to have to do with the uh, you know, DEA, Center for Disease Control, um, National, I forget to whatever it was, uh, Fauci was the head of um, that organization and all of these different you know, regulatory entities would probably be involved in the case of the pharmaceutical. Okay, coming over, taking a look, uh, leveraging information technology is obviously going to be huge here. Okay, and so uh, you can see that uh, we're going to have sufficient data management. And look, this is key. I mean, think about it. If you're developing some new product or something, the potential that someone's going to be trying to hack in and steal your technology and whatnot is a big deal, right? And if you're using some sort of external, um, you know, uh, research organization, sometimes, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies will go to universities, you're going to have to consider what their uh, uh, controls are as well, right? So it's looking at both the internal uh, and external processes, um, and the design uh, is driven by the value defined by management's needs, okay? Then you come down, what are the types of reports that are included in reporting? Uh, portfolio view, profile view, okay? And then reporting on culture seeks to measure and provide feedback on analysis of cultural trends, benchmarking, compensation schemes, lessons learned, review of behavioral trends, survey of risk attitudes, and risk awareness. You know, uh, I think these days, when I look at this, um, you know, cultural trends are very dynamic right now, and they probably will continue to be, you know, continue to evolve. 
And so that might be a hard one to keep a handle on, but obviously something that a year ago may have seemed like an appropriate practice may not be, um, you know, a year from now as things seem to keep changing for us, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at a couple questions here and see if we can, uh, what am I doing there? See if we can. Uh, identify some key terms here that we'll need to know. Okay, good. That's uh, looks like everyone's had a chance for a little under two minutes, but there's no need to wait since everyone had a chance to respond. And okay, pretty good. We bounced around a little bit here. The answer is A. Okay, when we're talking about core values, that is what that is a governance and culture thing. Um, again, I think you're seeing that we're going to have to make that flashcard that align the components of the ERM with the principles, okay? So uh, make sure you make that flashcard. A question like this will uh, be easy for you on the exam. Okay, let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, this next question. Okay, looks like most of us again have had a chance on this one. We're a little under the uh, 
two minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and share the results. And most of us got this right. 69% of us chose C, sharing. And um, when we look at this question, you can see that um, we have the company has identified business interruption events as a potential risk. The company elects not only to insure its properties, okay, but to buy down standard deductibles with additional premiums. Well, they're pursuing what? A sharing strategy here in which they're going to have more assurance, uh, insurance. Um, you know, avoidance would be that they're basically going to move away from the coast. Reduction, um, you know, maybe they would fortify the buildings so that they're not um, going to be as impact, impacted by a hurricane. Um, you know, acceptance would be what, hey, we're just not going to do anything, right? But getting more insurance would be sharing the risk. Okay. Okay, good. And I think you saw that we made flashcards some cool terms that would help you with that. Okay, good. Now you come over and we get learn, turn to module three now, which is Sarbanes-Oxley. Okay, now you probably have had some exposure. Sarbanes-Oxley is an accounting major. Um, you have seen discussion of in 2002 after uh, scandals, shenanigans like um, Enron and WorldCom. Congress got into the act there and, and said, well, we're going to uh, put some uh, provisions together that will, and I always laugh when they say, we're gonna put some provisions together so this will never happen again. And I'm always like, look out, that means it's gonna happen again. Witness you know, some of the things that went on in 2008 and they had to do something else after that, the Dodd-Frank Act. So you know, they're always saying this will never happen again, but in 2002, they passed Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes was a senator, a Democrat. Oxley was the House member, a Republican. They got together to help pass uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Now, Sarbanes-Oxley has certain titles. You don't need to memorize titles, uh, but you do need to understand what some of the significant um, objectives of the titles were, but you don't have to memorize them by title. Okay, but you need to understand what some of the things are that were brought in by these various titles. So we describe it in accordance with titles. Again, you don't have to know the titles of the act. You don't need to call them out <clears throat> by title, but you need to understand what the thrust of some of these things were. Okay, so let's just go ahead and we start over here with uh, Title Three. And Title III is what required that there be a public company audit committee, okay? Audit committee that is directly responsible for appointment compensation oversight of the public accounting firm. In other words, when you looked at what happened with Enron, there was certain pro uh, pressures being put on by the entity management. We want a separate board of directors um, committee the audit committee to be involved in hiring, firing, monitoring what it is that the external auditors will do. So the auditor reports directly to that audit committee and um, the audit committee is responsible for resolving disputes between the auditor and management. Okay, now coming down, sorry, I had a little trouble seeing some of my notes here. <clears throat> Coming down, note that audit committee members are to be members of the issuer's board of directors. Issuer is a term for public companies and be otherwise independent. Independence criteria are as follows. Let's flashcard some of these, okay? So what happens? Audit committee members may not accept compensation from the issuer for consulting or advisory purposes. Audit committee members may not be an affiliated person of the issuer. Affiliation means a person having the ability to influence financial decisions, okay? Audit committees must establish procedures. So I just want you to flashcard those two, okay? And then audit committees must establish procedures to accept reports of complaints. They call these whistleblower um, opportunities, right? Internal control procedures uh, must 
accommodate confidential anonymous reports of employees and procedures must accommodate receipt and retention of complaints. And why don't you go ahead and flashcard those? And the issue there, you can almost hear the story of Enron coming out in some of these things and that there was some whistleblowing going on and the company was simply, you know, sweeping that stuff under the rug, you know, uh, taking a punitive approach to those that were bringing some things to uh, their attention. Uh, just as a side, uh, I think it's important that you under, understand that we're talking about federal statute here, right? States have gone further with some of these things, um, but that would be test on CPA exam, okay? For example, in the state of California, they are now requiring that there be a certain amount of uh, gender diversity, ethnic diversity uh, on boards of directors. And if you combine that, with the issue that there has to be somebody with financial knowledge on a board of directors, I see an opportunity for you in passing the CPA exam to be somebody that would see yourself sitting on a board of directors, potentially being involved uh, in the audit committee. So always keep that in the back of your mind that that is uh, something that could be a very uh, interesting uh, outcome to your career and working hard to pass the CPA exam, right? Okay, now you come over and you take a look at the uh, next page. And let's take a look at corporate responsibility for financial reporting. Okay, so we understood something about the board of directors, but now we see that the CEO and CFO must sign that they a certification representing that they have done what? Looked at the annual quarter reports and they have reviewed them. There are no untrue statements, okay? Uh, the CEO and CFO signing have responsibilities for internal controls. Remember, we talked about them being designed and being effective. So now some of the stuff that we talked about that was contemplated in the COSO model has worked its way into federal statute saying, hey, you're gonna certify that the internal controls are doing some of those things that they don't call out COSO here, but that, we're con that we've seen were contemplated COSO. COSO uh, framework came out in the late 80s. Sarbanes-Oxley is what, 2002. Um, you know, there was push before Sarbanes-Oxley, before Enron, for some of these things to be part of a corporate governance structure, um, you know, back in, like I said, the 80s and 90s. And, you know, it was fought by the public companies. They lobbied, no, we don't want to do all these different things. And then when Enron WorldCom came, that's usually when something that's been sitting, you know, sort of in the bottom drawer that's been proposed that people think are too radical, then all of a sudden they say, oh, here, now do this stuff that we've been talking about. Uh, for years. So uh, you can see that even though uh, COSO came first, some of the things that are in there started working their way into the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, okay? And then that the, um, you know, controls are effective. The CEO, CFO have to also sign that if there were deficiencies in the internal control, and notice here they use the uh, AICPA auditing standards term, U.S. auditing standard term, uh, significant deficiencies, that those have been reported, any fraud has been reported, um, and um, whether there have been significant changes to the internal control. So I don't know. I look at that and I highlight that whole thing, and I think that you should flashcard all this. Okay, what are the CEO CFO signing off on? Okay, I think that's worth I think that's worth a flashcard. Okay, now what happens? You will, as a CEO, CFO, et cetera, have to forfeit any bonuses if there has been a restatement due to material non-compliance of financial reporting requirements. And um bonuses for incentive-based or equity-based compensation, gains on sales of securities during the last 12 months, flash card that. That's really this concept of disgorgement, okay? If you did something wrong and you benefited from it, we're going to disgorge you 
of those uh, benefits of any, I don't know that you'd call that necessarily ill-gotten gains, but that's sort of the way the law often looks at that. You're going to have to give back any, um, you know, ill-gotten gains that it came from some, you know, problem that you had. Okay. Taking a look, conflict of interest provisions, issuers. Again, guys, all of this relates to public companies. When we're talking about Sarbanes-Oxley, we're talking about public companies. Federal government has the ability to apply statute to uh, to public companies because of the interstate commerce provisions um, that um, you know exist in many areas beyond just financial reporting. So uh, issuers are generally prohibited from making personal loans. Exceptions apply if we're talking about consumer credit loans that are made in the ordinary course of business, and if there's no preferential treatment to uh, some of those. So, um, you know, you can still have a credit card and that kind of stuff. These are very similar to state laws that relates to CPAs, which we don't get to in the BEC section, but we'll talk about that when you get to the audit section of the exam a little bit later. But uh, for directors, executive officers, they have exceptions of, uh, for personal loans, and you should go ahead and flashcard those. Okay, come over, management assessment of the internal control, okay? And uh, this is under section 404. And sometimes I hear folks and they'll say, under section 404 of Sarbanes-Oxley, and then they start listing everything under Sarbanes-Oxley, even if it's in a different title, okay? Section 404 just relates to internal control reporting, okay? And so under Section 404, the company has to include in their annual report a statement that they believe that, um, that they are responsible for the internal control, an assessment of the effectiveness of the internal control, and then the auditor has to come along and a test as to management's assessment of the internal control. So management is the one and they have to get off their butt and they have to do some work to make the assessment as to the effectiveness of internal control. They provide that in a written report that goes along, in, that is included in their annual report. And then the auditors come along and they have to give a, an a, a, a attestation as to management's assertions uh, regarding the internal control that, can, that must be contained in the annual report. So flashcard that, okay, that's a big deal, especially for accountants and CPAs, right? Okay, now, code of ethics needs to be in place. <clears throat> I was on an assignment one time <clears throat> where there was no code of ethics at all for a credit union, and um, that we were looking at, uh, we were looking at how the NC... National Credit Union Administration, GAO. I worked for the GAO, as I mentioned last time, for 26 years. And I got on an audit looking at how credit unions were being regulated by the National Credit Union Administration. And one of the uh, credit unions that I was responsible for reviewing had no code of ethics. And all kinds of bad things were happening that would have been covered under that code of ethics. So uh, when we were going to write that report, Someone was like, well, John, we're, what are you going to use as criteria for that? Because it doesn't say that credit unions in any of the NCUA laws or regulations doesn't say that credit unions have to have a um, code of ethics. And so I use the provision of Sarbanes to say, well, by analogy, if it's necessary for uh, public companies, why would it not be necessary for financial institutions? Um, that are backed by the full faith and credit of the federal government. And I was able to get that past referencing and able to make that recommendation that uh, there be a requirement that it, uh, credit unions have code of ethics. Okay. Now you come over and you take a look at disclosure of audit committee uh, financial expert. Okay. So at least one member of the audit committee must be a financial expert. That's you guys, state of California. There's going to be more opportunity for you to serve on a board of directors. What better way to demonstrate that you are a financial expert than that you pass the uh, CPA exam, you are a CPA, right? Okay, so 
what should you have as that expert? Okay, and let's go ahead and take a look and let's flashcard this. Understanding of gap. You're going to get that through your study of the FAR section of the exam. So experience and preparation or auditing financial statements of comparable issuers. You, you get your CPA, you work, right? Application of gap. you. Experience with internal controls, you. Understanding of audit committee functions, you, you, you. Okay, so those are the kinds of things that they're going to be looking for coming from you and that passing the CPA exam is a good start towards all of that, right? And then enhanced review of periodic disclosures, the SEC is required to review disclosures made by issuers on their 10K, that's their annual form, but also um, 10Qs are the quarterly filings. And when scheduling reviews, the SEC considers the following. Um, and um, you can go ahead and flashcard this, okay, what the SEC will consider. Restatements, experience with volatility in stock prices compared to uh, other issuers, issuers of large market capitalization, Market capitalization is just the value of the company that's associated with whatever the um, you know amounts that are being offered for their stocks and whatnot are. Emerging companies with disparities in price to earnings ratios, issuers who operate significantly affect any material sector of the economy. So you know, again, the SEC is going to come in and look at what they want to, but these. Are really just some sort of tripwires triggers that would cause the SEC to maybe take a closer look at an entity. Okay, coming down, criminal penalties. What does criminal penalty mean? Criminal penalty means jail. It means if you do these things, you're going to be showering with strangers. Okay, if you do something wrong, you're going to be in trouble. Okay, it's criminal. Okay, civil is often constituted by fines, okay? Criminal generally carries with it some jail time, okay? So statute of limitations for security fraud, statute of limitations no later than the earlier of two years after the discovery of the facts consult, uh, constituting the violation or five years uh, after the violation. So you can flashcard that. Whistleblower protection, okay? An employee who lawfully provides evidence of fraud, may not be discharged, suspended, harassed, or any other way discriminated against, okay? And if an employee is suffering some of those activities, then they can go ahead and ask for um, aid from the Department of Labor, and they're gonna have to rehire the person, compensation. I don't know if the person would want to go back to work after something like that, but um, all of those, and there could be disgorgement. Um, when we look at criminal fines and penalties, okay, there could be some fine, that's money, or imprisonment or both, not to exceed 25 years. <laughs> and then, um, <clears throat> you know, um, there could be the disgorgement that I talked about. And then conspiracy, you know, you sit there and you say, well, you know, I uh, <clears throat> wasn't the one that came up with all this plan. It was Joe over here. But yeah, I did kind of, you know, do certain things that Joe asked me to. Well, that's conspiracy because you don't have to be the one that came up with the entire fraud. If you're involved in the whole process or the entire, you know, mis you know, behavior here, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be that you were the key guy, you know, that figured it all out. If you were involved somehow, that's called conspiracy, okay, and you would be uh, in trouble for that as well, okay? Okay, good. So those are some of the key things. I'm not going to start to get into, um, you know, some of these more um, detailed, granular things. If you run into a question that asks about something that we haven't covered here that I haven't asked you flashcard. Look to see if you have a Becker flashcard already made on that. If not, you can add something that you think is appropriate. So not only is it the flashcards I'm talking about, the ones that come with your package that you acquired here through Golden Gate, 
but also ones that you're looking at a particular question when you're doing your homework and you're like, this would be a good flashcard to help me remember this. Add that to the pile. Okay. All right. So let's just go ahead then and let's take a look at <clears throat> a couple questions here. <clears throat> okay guys let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one and um i would have thought this one would be pretty self-explanatory i mean most of us got it right 77 percent, but i'm a little surprised that we weren't more around 100 percent on this one um, and that Sarbanes-Oxley dealt with what financial reporting and requirements for you know the audit and being involved in the audit committee and that sort of thing. So um, what happened? Just take a look. And when they talk about a financial expert, then we wouldn't want a limited understanding. We'd want what a thorough understanding of auditing standards. Uh, education as a uh, certified financial planner really is not relevant to the financial reporting mechanism of a um, you know public company. Uh, experience in preparation of tax returns might be nice, but it doesn't have a direct cause and effect to the financial reporting aspects. Experience with internal controls, sarbanes oxley under Section 404 has the company what? Uh, um, taking responsibility for the internal control and assessing the effectiveness of it. So yeah, we do want an expert there. Okay, so I think I had you flashcard some of those, but uh, you could also think about it from what is the spirit of Sarbanes? What is it regulating? It's regulating the financial reporting aspects of public companies. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at the next one. Okay, it looks like everyone's had a chance to look at this one, so I'm not going to delay uh, sharing the results. And again, we're around 77%. Um, 
don't use your imagination unless I tell you to. Okay. Um, the only one that we talked about here was receiving personal loan that are not in the ordinary course of business. That is not okay uh, for executives and officers. The rest of these, if you selected those, those were pure pigments of your imagination um, that you kind of pulled out from somewhere. So be careful. Um, so you remember for the CPA exam, you've got to suspend your creativity uh, to a large extent and make sure that you're flashcarding and understanding some of the key things that uh, are very specific to being able to answer the questions. Okay, good. We're doing pretty good with time. Um, I believe, although we're you know kind of pushing a little bit, I think we should be able to get through module four. That's going to give you a nice foundation to get through and complete your homework for the first four modules. And remember, I will be looking uh, to see how you're uh, making progress through these. Now, when I looked at this module business processes, I was a little disappointed in that um, I felt like it was very accounting function centric. Meanwhile, you know, business processes go beyond just accounting. So I'm going to go through with you some of the accounting centric language that is in here. I can tell that an auditor wrote this, okay, because they're all about documents that an auditor would be looking at as part of these different business processes. Um, and I'm going to try where I can to maybe add some more operational aspects to business processes that from the entity standpoint, um, they would probably want to be um, concerned with. Okay, so we start to look at these different processes and I'm going to start with what some people think is the most important part of the business process, which is the revenue process okay and the revenue process is made up recurring business activities surrounding the sale and delivery of goods services including the collection of payments from customers and so we look at the revenue process activities here okay and it involves sales delivery of goods customer billing payment collections now I look at that and i'm like okay that sounds a lot to do with accounting okay but how about what? How about, let's add one, okay? How about customer service? Okay, why wouldn't that be part of the revenue process and that you could be following up to see if customers are satisfied, are there customer complaints, um, that sort of thing, right? Okay, so I'm gonna add that one. Okay, now you come over and they talk about documents associated with the process. I don't know, guys. If you come across a problem that asks you about a document that is relevant to a business process, I'm going to tell you now, just make a flashcard of that, okay? Uh, sitting here and trying to memorize documents associated with business processes or me reading that off to you now, is not much good. I would say align it with the questions that you see. If you see a question that asks you about a business process, look to see if that's in your Becker flashcards. If it's not, make up a flashcard so you will never miss that question in your homework again. And then if it comes up on your exam, you've already memorized that with a flashcard. But I'm not going to spend our time together here, uh, you know, reading through documents associated with a process. Okay. Now, we talk about the expenditure process, okay? Let's look at the activities here. And again, this is very accounting-centric. Placing an order, goods are delivered, receipt and approval of billing, okay? By matching the purchase order, et cetera, you know? And then bill payment. But then I'm going to add number five, how about quality of goods and services purchased. Okay, there should be some process there to make sure that we're satisfied with the quality, some sort of survey that goes out. We're used, to, you know, internally, were you satisfied with the product that we got from this particular vendor? 
Um, maybe you're doing a variance analysis where you're looking at what? Variance in the quantity that's being used. Maybe we're using more materials than the budget anticipated because there's a poor quality of the materials that we're using. Okay, so again, I don't think it is limited here to just, you know, these sort of accounting documents working their way through the accounting system, which is what is talked about in this illustration. Again, if you see a question that asks you about a particular document for a particular process, make a flashcard for that, okay? Okay, now human resources and payroll processing, I felt that they did start to get a little beyond just the pure accounting part of things here. And so we have what hiring, onboarding and trading, training, establishing reporting structures, assigning employees, monitoring, reviewing performance, responding to employee concerns, establishing, enforcing, um, you know, certain disciplinary termination procedures, whatever. I look at that and I'm like, okay, let's flashcard that. I like that because that's getting beyond just pure accounting. And then payroll process activities. I like some of these because establishing compensation plans, assigning activity reports, third party withholding and taxes. Okay, we're probably getting more back into accounting. Payroll disbursement. Yeah, okay, let's flashcard some of those. I think they did a better job here than just listing off how documents flow uh, through the accounting um, process. Although responding to employee concerns, I did find myself um, interested in adding something there. Um, these days, big deal is what? Retention, okay? And also what? EEO compliance. How about that? Okay, so there's also compliance issues. Okay, EEO, guys, is equal employment opportunity compliance, okay? Okay, good. Uh, and then again, they give us documents, time cards and stuff, payroll register. Again, if you see a question, that relates to that, uh, then you want to go ahead and, uh, <clears throat> you know, flashcard that in a particular question. Manufacturing process activities, product design and engineering, product develop, manufacturing forecasting and scheduling, manufacturing operations, okay, manufacturing fixed asset accounting reporting. Uh, how about quality control? Okay, again, maybe doing some sort of variance analysis to see how we're meeting our budgets in terms of uh, <clears throat> the number of units we produce, what, are, what is our, you know, we're we having a lot of spoilage, normal spoilage, abnormal spoilage, et cetera. Okay, so you can flashcard those because, again, I think those do a good job of going beyond just um, discussion of accounting. Okay, and then <clears throat> again, a bunch of documents. I'm not worried about those. Okay, and then finance and reporting, and finance and reporting involve the treasury function, general ledger updates, financial statement, and managerial report generation. And you can go ahead and flashcard that. Okay, with all that, let's go ahead and let's just um, oh. Sorry, guys, we still have uh, some discussion here of separation of duties. Let's look at that a little bit, okay? So with the separation of duties, okay, we separate the ARC is the mnemonic. We separate the authorization from the record keeping from the custody, okay? So if I'm authorized to order the goods, I should not also be the one that will receive the goods at the shipping department, okay? The shipping and receiving department, there should be somebody separate that receives that, and then a third party that does the accounting to pay the invoice and whatnot on that, okay? Now, ultimately, those goods may be delivered to me, but they should go through the receiving department first, as an example of separation of duty, okay? Now, when we look, we can look at this concept of separation of duty in an IT department, okay? So let's start to flashcard that, okay? So there should be separation between the system use and users, system coding or programming, transaction and data entry, data custody and storage, authorization responsibility, 
monitoring and response to exceptions. Okay. And so go ahead and flashcard those separations that are relevant to IT. Looking at input and edit checks. Okay. And when we look at these, we look at them from the standpoint of preventative controls here. Okay. So using consistent forms so that people get routine and how they're entering data. Completeness checks, um, for example, um, I looked at a system where they had a process where at the very beginning, the person had to look at how many documents they were going to input, and they had to say, I'm going to input 23 documents. And then the system would count the documents that they entered, and if they entered 22, it wouldn't accept the entire batch. Okay, that's an example of a completeness check reasonableness check. Am I putting a number in an alpha uh, field? Am I putting an a, a alphabet where a number should be, right? Okay. Um, again, field checks. Um, yeah, I guess re that would be field check, what I just described. Uh, reasonableness check, uh, logic of input values, for example, debits should equal credits is a good reasonable test and any these days any uh, general ledger software will not allow you to put in a journal entry where the debits don't equal the credits size amounts we're dealing with payroll that's a big deal right you shouldn't have somebody being able to print uh, you know issue themselves a million dollar paycheck okay uh, limit uh or establish either upper or lower limits for the input data uh Sign check designates if a numeric value can be positive or negative, okay? All of these things, guys, are going to be steps that will be what? Input checks. Uh, yeah, okay. Why don't you flashcard those? Those are all good input checks. Those are different than processing controls, okay? So processing controls include data matching, okay, such as purchase orders, uh, input validation, okay, if there's an information being put in, in batches, was the input in, uh, in, incorrectly input, sequence check, okay, cross footing, okay, all of these would be good examples of processing controls, why don't you flashcard those, standard uh, data controls, Okay, access authorization. Should you be in a particular system? Are things in a safe location? Okay, um, you know, visitors should not have the access to the computer room, right? Uh, read only rights so that uh, data isn't lost. Okay, coming over, change control. Okay, if there is a change to a system, it should be documented and appropriately approved. Whatever the change is, regular backups. Okay. Um, there should also be, you know, guidance as to how to conduct these things with the backups. Uh, I was on an assignment one time where the credit union that I was looking at, um, what they did was part of that same assignment that I was talking about for the uh, code of conduct, um, different, different credit union. What they did was they ran their backup and their maintenance at the same time. Somebody was trying to get out of there on a Friday night. And so they ran their maintenance on their system while they were running the backup. Well, guess what? The thing crashed and they had no backup, okay? Because it crashed while they were doing the backup. So procedurally backup, then maintenance, right? Those sorts of things uh, would be the type of thing that uh, should be uh, good control. Common defective, uh, detective controls, that's after the problem has happened. Periodic reconciliation, review of employee access rights. Uh, spreadsheet controls, access and authorization controls, locked cells, data validation, <coughs> change controls, regular backup to a uh, spreadsheet. I think we've all experienced that, you know, you have all your uh, genius ideas on a spreadsheet, you forget to um, back it up, and then, um, you know, you got to start over again, right? Supervisory and monitoring controls, um, review uh, of coming over, 
let's just take a look, hiring guidelines and whatnot, but a review of key performance indicators, okay, for measurement of process, performance and review periodically, dashboards, budgets and forecasts are obviously a performance reviews, okay. Mandatory job rotations and vacations. Sometimes we find that fraud happens when that one person never wanted to take a vacation. Okay, we think how dedicated they are, and then it turns out that uh, you know they were stealing the whole time. Okay, come over and um, documentation techniques. Okay, uh, process narratives are a way describing the way a process is supposed to work. Data flow diagrams, flow charts. Um, is another example. Um, and then uh, system interface diagrams, okay? And the benefits of appropriate documentation, okay? And let's go ahead and flashcard that. And one of the big benefits that people talk about here is if you have this, when your auditors come in to ask, hey, explain the system and where the internal controls are, you just hand them these documents, right? You can the flow chart or whatever, but uh, the, dot, the benefits are data input steps that need to uh, have input checks, manual processes, computer processes, process concerning creation of documents, description of activities by department, allow for visual review of segregation of duties. Diagrams may indicate potential inefficiencies, waste or errors. Flashcard that. Often when I see the word benefit versus risks, I ask for a flashcard on that because I can see a potential uh, essay question coming. Okay, with the little bit of time we have left, guys, and I know we went kind of quickly through that, but I think that um, a lot of that was pretty self-explanatory. And again, I would take the approach of making flashcards as you go through some questions like the ones that you're going to see here as we conclude class tonight. Okay, guys, let's look at this one. And um, yeah, most of us got this right. Um, again, this is one of those documentation questions. And I think where you might have had a little trouble if you picked maybe, looks like some folks pick C, is, well, what is a bill of lading? Okay, bill of lading is a packing slip. That basically goes what? That goes to the uh, purchaser of whatever it is that we have sold. And it says, this is what's in this package, okay? That's a bill of lading. Um, the invoice, the receiving report, the purchase order are documents that we're going to have in our possession and Ms. Tina would be looking those to make sure that it is a valid uh, payment that's being made. Uh, the details of what's included in a package may not be as relevant to uh, Tina's analysis here. So most of us got it right, the answer here is B. Okay, all right, good. Let's look at our last question.
<clears throat> okay guys let's go ahead and um let's take a look at this one because we're getting a little later it's already eight o'clock and i don't want to keep us too late over and um looks like most of us got this right that it is a flow chart um, I think there's some key words that are worth us spending a little bit of time, though, that maybe would have um, helped us to narrow this down to maybe one or two choices. Edward was recently hired to be an internal auditor. His assignment is to create a visual depiction. OK, well, that takes off process narrative because the narrative is words. Right. So that's not going to be the correct answer. I'm trying to put an X to that. OK. All right, good. Um, his manager noted that Edward should indicate whether processes are manual or automated and label current controls and identify potential control deficiencies. Now, data flow diagram is just showing what? This is the source of the data. This is where it goes. It's not going to have as much information about controls and whatnot. System interface diagram, although it may be useful to identify what potential um, uh, inappropriate segregation of duties, um, I don't think that it is going to uh, talk about processes manual or automated and label uh, current controls. So you might have had that down between those two, but I think once you consider the level of detail being talked about here, as most of you did, you got to correct it. Uh, flow chart would be the uh, best answer here. Okay, some of these questions I liken to running rather than weightlifting. Okay, and that you just have to what develop enough repetition with these to get some endurance around these questions to be able to get these kinds of things right. Weightlifting is more, hey, do I really understand the concept here that's going to allow me to uh, be able to crush through a more complicated question that's just not asking me to choose amongst the listing of documents here. Okay. Any questions, guys? Actually, I actually have a quick one. Um, I think you might have mentioned it in the beginning, but um, I came in a couple minutes after you might have started. And did you want us to order the 4.1 BEC book? Yes, uh, go ahead and do that. Unfortunately, I did not get a definitive answer from Becker, which I'm a little um, disappointed in that. Um, but uh, seeing as I have not heard any indication that the 4.1 book is, uh, or the next BEC book, whatever number that would be, is intimate to being uh, released. I guess we're just gonna have to go with our best bet in order 4.1. If some kind of uh, shit hits the fan <laughs> where you know they didn't answer our question, then we did the wrong thing. We'll go from there because then we're gonna have a little bit of a come to Jesus meeting with them. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, guys? Okay, if that's it, uh, you've got the information to get you through module four for chapter one, and I will be checking on that. And other than that, uh, don't forget to turn in your CPA planning document. That's coming up. And then I will see you on Tuesday next week. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.